Rahman Rahim. In the previous three lectures, we have covered the first three sections of the paper Crisis in Islamic Economics. In this segment, we will provide a summary and synthesis focused on answering the two puzzles about Islamic economics that were brought up earlier. Uh, to do so, we will cover a lot of material that is not present in the paper. So the two puzzles can be described briefly as follows. Why did Islamic economics emerge in the middle of the 20th century? And given that the presentation, subject matter, methodology of Islamic economics as uh, propounded today, it's unique. You can't find this in uh, the intellectual tradition of Islam. How can this subject be Islamic? Uh, anything that is Islamic should be tied up to our own intellectual tradition. So these are the two questions that we will seek to answer in this lecture. So understanding the historical background of why IE emerged in 20th century is quite complex. We must start with a different question. Why did Western economics emerge in the 18th century? Basically, it is dated to the publication of Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith in 1776. The complex answer to this question is provided in this book, The Great Transformation by Karl Polanyi. And uh, the essence of the book says that traditional society had markets which were part of society, but the society as a whole was dominant. So social structures, political structures controlled the economic structures. And this, in the Great Transformation, uh, became reversed and markets took control of society. Social structures and political structures were subordinate to the economics. So how did markets become so powerful as to control the whole society? This is the process of the Great Transformation. When markets became dominant, then economic theory, which is the, which is the theory of market society, also became dominant. So how did this happen? Uh, we can not study it in detail, but we'll provide brief hints and sketch. To understand the differences, we start with the pre-market society. What was society like before markets became so powerful? So in a traditional society is paternalistic, that is, uh, the rich and the powerful take care of the poor and the weak. That's called social responsibility. It is regulated. You can't do whatever you like to do. Everyone is bound to obey uh, social welfare. Uh, selfishness uh, is not allowed and is considered bad. Also, we live in harmony with the planet. The planet feeds us and provides for us. So uh, the Mother Earth conception that we take care of it and it takes care of us. Also, there's the conception that the society is one body. If any part hurts, then uh, the whole of it hurts. Now, this is not equality. It's very important to understand that uh, traditional society doesn't have equality. The, it is often said that the head and the feet are different, but they are part of the same structure and they are united with common goals. So these are the conceptions of traditional societies all over the world. The Industrial Revolution started in England 50 years before the rest of Europe for complex historical reasons which we cannot describe in full. The first step was the process of enclosures where the uh, biggest privatization in history took place, where all of the common land was privatized and taken up, enclosed in boundaries and made inaccessible to the poor. Uh, this led to the creation of the labor force because the poor could not go and fish in uh, rivers or hunt in forests or uh, pick uh, fruit and vegetables. Uh, all of the land was out of bound, so they had to sell their lives for food. Uh, the systematic agriculture led to an agricultural revolution which created surplus foods and this uh, allowed the creation of a labor force in the towns who could work for industries and enabled the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution led to creation of massive amounts of surplus products, much more than uh, you could use. So that created a consumer society. People had to 
consume uh, previously self sufficiency living simply was a virtue but no longer possible in a market society because there is so much produced that you have to uh, consume luxuries you have to consume surplus and all of this becomes a marker of status so it becomes a virtue instead of a vice uh, where is all of this surplus going to go they'll all go to waste unless we have something like money which allows us to carry the surplus over from present generation to the next it created a labor market you could buy and sell human lives in order to produce wealth it created a market for land which basically involved selling of the mother earth conception and created the is is the root of the environmental crisis we see today so basically in a market society everything is for sale and the value of a human life is according to how much the person can earn the goal of life becomes to earn money and everything is allowed in order to do this so you say that all is fair in the pursuit of pleasure and power and profits this ethics that everything can be done for profits and the necessity to find markets for all of the surplus led to global conquest and con colonization initially the goal was to trade but all over the world societies were self sufficient they didn't want to buy anything from outsiders so it became necessary to destroy the self sufficient societies and also to create a religion which says that self sufficiency is bad and luxury is good and you should pursue wealth and you should maximize the pleasure you get from consumption and this is all uh, unnatural uh, in traditional societies you don't maximize pleasure from consumption consumption is something you do for a necessary thing and the pleasure of life comes from uh, having friends and poetry and uh, sports and literature so pleasure from consumption is the goal of a market society so basically the global conquest and colonization created uh, spread this religion of economics throughout the world by the early 20th century 90% of islamic lands were under colonial rule by europeans and one essential uh, fact which we must understand is that colonization is not just physical it is mental uh, you cannot control a small amount of people cannot control a large amount of population without controlling their minds and so this requires brainwashing and one of the uh, essential aspects of brainwashing is the idea that the west is vastly superior in, in everything including their intellectual achievements their philosophy their religions their sciences everything is superior to anything that we have as discussed earlier world wars 1 and 2 sapped the powers of europe and enabled liberation movements to succeed all over the colonized lands and part of this revolutionary struggle was an idea that we have an alternative to offer we have a revolutionary and radical alternative system and islamic economics is a better economic system than capitalism and then socialism so at this point we can answer the first question why did islamic economics emerge in the 20th century the first uh, part of the answer is that in the west market society emerged which made economics their religion and made economics the dominant feature economics is uh, is uh, controls politics and society and this religion was spread throughout the world by global colonization and the freedom struggles which took place in islamic lands following world war 2 said that we have an alternative to offer we have a different society we have a different system and because the west had made economics into a religion so uh, when we were presenting our alternative system we also highlighted the economics teaching and said that these teachings are uh, superior to the western economic teachings now it's important to understand that economics has always been there but it economics was subordinate to politics and social uh, teachings of islam so it was never presented as the dominant and main teaching of islam it was a subordinate teaching but in order to counter western economics we had to create and highlight the economic teachings of islam and present them as an alternative 
Unfortunately, Islamic economics could not stay on its revolutionary goals and it itself, Islamic economics itself changed radically from first generation to second generation as we will discuss. After the revolution, many Muslim leaders were uh, thinking of creating a revolutionary alternative, but this did not happen. Uh, Europeans, in order to control the Islamic lands, they had created a secondary class of people who were sycophants and they were um, idolized the West and they were trained in modernity and they hated their own heritage and traditions and they wanted to follow the West. This coconut class, brown on the outside and white on the inside, uh, were became naturally rulers. They were actually ruling the country prior to liberation and they became the leaders of Islamic countries after the Europeans left. So political liberation was achieved, but mental liberation was not. And the revolutionary dreams of the first generation Islamic economics could not be fulfilled. And the institutional structures of Islamic societies, the political, economic, social, educational, governmental, judicial, they all remained locked into European Western pattern. So when the struggles to create a revolution uh, failed all over the Islamic world, it was tried and all over for a number of reasons, uh, too complex to discuss here. These attempts to achieve political control for uh, uh, Islamists failed. As a result, there was a rethinking of the strategy. The um, second generation said that, well, we can't achieve a revolution. We can't create an Islamic state based on the Khilafah, the Sharia, and the Madrasas, and all of the Islamic, and the Waqf, the, all of the Islamic institutions. So what we will do is we'll take capitalist economics and we will gradually transform it. And so there was, this was a pragmatic strategy. Let's instead of, since revolution cannot be achieved, let's work on a step-by-step -step change in the capitalist system to try to make it Islamic. While Islamic economists were trying to uh, make their subject more capitalistic, capitalism itself suffered from major crises which are currently uh, destroying the whole environment of the planet. There has been massive and increasing inequality which just keeps on increasing. So we see the misery of billions of people living under a dollar a day combined with the extreme luxury of the top 0.001%. In fact, maybe about 50 people own half of the wealth of the planet. The, in particular, the global financial crisis which took place in 2007 actually highlighted to everyone the failure of economic theory. There was widespread awareness of the failure. The Queen of England went to London School of Economics to ask why didn't you see it coming. The US Congress created a commission to explain the failure of economics as a science. In fact, the commission says that not only did economics fail to predict, they actually confidently told us that such a crisis could not happen. So very major economists made statement about how the profession as a whole has failed. So it's clear that economic theory or capitalist economic theory itself is in crisis. And the reason for the crisis is not just on theory front, but it's also on the practice front on how what's happening in the world economics is terrible economic outcomes for the vast majority of the people. So today, the second generation idea that Islamic economics is a branch of capitalist economics is um, in trouble because the crisis in second generation, the crisis in capitalism is also a crisis of second generation Islamic economics. First generation thought that Islamic economics was a revolutionary alternative to capitalism. So that is what we need today, an alternative to capitalism, not a branch of capitalism. So the paper itself cites a lot of uh, quotes from Islamic economics showing the awareness that second generation Islamic economics has failed. Uh, one, of these con uh, one of these quotes is from Manzar Kahf and it says that Islam, we didn't give any new ideas to the people about how to uh, manage economics. We were just, uh, just content to be a branch of capitalist economics. 
and uh, the present generation is tired and uh, can't do anything because uh, we can't we don't have any new ideas so the only solution to second generation is to abandon this whole effort and go back to the first generation uh, to create a revolutionary alternative and one of the keys this will be discussed in much greater detail what is the revolutionary the alternative in the fourth section of this paper that we are discussing. But one of the keys is that economics is founded on scarcity, but the first generation clearly rejected scarcity and said that no, Fadlullah is mentioned all over the Quran. There is abundance. Every, everything has been provided for us amply. And it's far beyond what we need. 